My name is Mark Porch and I'm the Chief Executive of a dementia research charity called BRACE. The films that follow were recorded at a conference we organised on the 4th of November 2014. We called it Dementia, Hope for the Future and it proved to be a justified title. What was most pleasing about the conference was how positive everyone was at the end. We had researchers, scientists, uh, campaigners, clinicians, people living with dementia, people with considerable talent and sheer bloody mindedness making a difference and slowly changing the world. I'd like to thank everybody who took part in that conference and helped in any way, particularly Martin Lewis for spending the, the day with us and sharing the whole thing in a calm and professional way. If when you've seen these films you have any questions for us or want to contact us for any reason whatsoever, we'd love to hear from you. Our contact details are on our website, uh, the, the details of which will appear at the bottom of this screen. Thank you. Morning everybody and welcome to Dementia Hope for the Future and thank you for being here. Um, this, this is um, an event we've put together to bring people together who wouldn't normally meet, uh, people whose paths wouldn't normally cross perhaps, but who are involved in different ways in the, in the fight against de dementia. So we hope you'll take away new ideas, you'll give people new ideas, you'll make new connections and possibly set up some useful co collaborations for the months ahead. Thank you for being here. Now, um, it's my pleasure to welcome Martin Lewis, uh, one of the UK's best known and most respected presenters of news and current affairs. Uh, he's been well known to us for many years through ITN and the, and the BBC, and, and it's a great honour to have him with us here. Uh, perhaps less well known is the range of charitable work he does. I've been amazed by the sheer range of causes that he supported o over many years. Um, I won't list them all, but um, perhaps I'll just mention that he is currently the chair um, of the NCBO, and he also broadcasts regularly on Age UK's own, own radio station, which I think has about a quarter of a million listeners, if I'm, that's right. So we're delighted to have him with us. And many of you might remember that uh, 21 years ago, he made headlines himself by calling for there to be more good news. And many people misunderstood what he meant by that but um, I understood it to mean that news coverage wasn't balanced. Uh, we, we very readily um, report and therefore listen to the negative, the scurrilous, uh, the shocking, the frightening, which tend to dominate our news headlines. But there's a lot of good work going on in the world and that doesn't get as much attention. And I hope today that we're going to have a, a much more balanced presentation of what's going on with dementia. Bit of a dangerous thing for me to promise because I exercise no editorial control over what happens from this point onwards. Um, but I'm very confident that we will hear something of the pain and the suffering caused by, by, by the dementia. But we're surrounded by people who are working hard to improve the world as a place to live for people who are living with dementia. We're surrounded by people who are working quietly in labs and clinics uh, to, to make a difference, to try to find um, answers through, through medical science. And we're going to hear from at least two people who are themselves li living with d dementia who will be able to show us that there is life after, after diagnosis. So today is about hope. Now I have some good news for you, which is I'm going to get off the platform and hand over to Martin, if I may. Well, Mark, thanks very much indeed. And it's a, a real delight and a pleasure to uh, to be here with so many people looking at the, uh, uh, at the whole question of dementia from so many different angles. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm just amazed at how many of you are here, actually, because it, uh, it is quite a formidable gathering. I won't make the mistake that President Reagan made when he was campaigning on behalf of George Bush, and I think it was the 1988 presidential election. And he arrived at a small town in Ohio, having been told there wouldn't be many people there because it was just a photo opportunity, but word that he was coming had spread ahead of him. And when he arrived, the, he found to his amazement that there were several thousand people filling the corral in front of him and overflowing onto the hills and fields beyond. And President Reagan cast around for the right phrase to sum up this enormously impressive turnout. And what he came up with was, well, ladies and gentlemen, it sure is a pleasure to see such a dense crowd here today. <laughs> I wouldn't dream of making a mistake like that in such a, in such a distinguished 
uh, company. But I really come here really from three perspectives. Um, the first is that my, my first wife, uh, Liz, uh, had Huntington's disease, and so I lived uh, with that particular form of dementia for many, many years, as did my children and my younger daughter in particular. Um, and it was very interesting to notice that she gave up work in order to look after her mother for a couple of years. And as a result of that, um, she, um, we were able to postpone the time at which my wife went into a nursing home. Um, and the doctors had said she should have gone in earlier. And in fact, the trigger for that happening was really the fact that everyone around was being pulled down by, uh, by Huntington's disease, which, as you know, is, 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 it affects speech, it affects balance, it affects, it affects the mind, and so on. And, uh, um, and th the fascinating thing was the help that we had around us uh, from, from an admiral nurse who was absolutely, absolutely terrific, uh, an admiral nurse who basically they do, for, they do for dementia what Macmillan nurses do for cancer. And uh, I, I can't tell you how incredible it was to have that degree of backup and support. And, and in, in, in fact, the, um, you know, they were helping my daughter, they were helping me, they were helping our other daughter who was actually away in America but was coming back and forth the whole time. And I, I have to say that there did come a point where uh, my younger daughter, she was getting more and more depressed <coughs> by everything that was going on, and I had to look very hard at the effect on her. <coughs> and as a result of that, um, we took the decision, where, as, as I say, we, we managed to keep my wife out of a nursing home for, 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 for two years more than the doctors actually recommended, but then there came a point when she had to go in and have specialist, uh, specialist care from nurses who specialised in, uh, in Huntington's disease. So, so I know very much where all of you here are coming from, from the different angles at which you are looking at this whole question of dementia. And uh, that was, for us, a 15-year journey, um, uh, which, which uh, was something that... Uh, what's incredible is that we found, and I certainly found on behalf of my daughters, that, that you rise to a challenge, that when a challenge is there and you, and you, are, you have no option but to respond to it. And, uh, and you know, I like to think that we did the best that we could um, for as long as we could. Um, I am I'm also particularly pleased, and I, I, I just pass this on to you, that Huntington's, as you know, has a 50% chance of being passed on to the next generation. And uh, both my daughters have now had the test that they refused to have for about 10 years. And both of them are now free uh, of the Huntington's gene, which actually that particular gene happened to come from me rather than, uh, rather than from my wife. Uh, so it can't come back. And, 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 and that's, anyway, that I hope gives you some idea of the perspective of where I'm coming from um, on this. The second perspective is to do with something you touched on, Mark, which is the, the wireless. And uh, the wireless is a wonderful name for a radio station for the over 50s, started by Age UK. And it is anything and everything to do with advice, help, information um, for the over 50s, the over 60s, the over 70s. Uh, it, it is a 24 7 station, it's on the Age UK website. Uh, but in, in London, it is also uh, on the digital radio, and that is going to be rolled out across the country. Over the next uh, over the next few years, so that it, it will eventually become a national station. But it's worth going into and listening to my program in particular on the wireless, um, <laughs> which is at six o'clock on Wednesday evening, repeated one o'clock on uh, on Sunday. It's a one-hour show with interviews with uh, with a little bit of music, and uh, it, it's uh, in which, incidentally, my my elder daughter sings the the song that plays us out. Every uh, uh, for every program, um, but basically what we're doing uh, with the wireless is um, providing, as I say, 24/7. So you get lots of music as well. You get David Diddy Hamilton. I'm sure some of you will remember him. He's back in action. Uh, we've got lots of other famous disc jockeys. We've got the Green Goddess who is there doing uh, lots of health stuff, and it's a really really interesting program, particularly when you think that the enormous increase in the number of people 
over 50 and over 60 uh, that are taking place in this country. I heard an amazing statistic the other day, which is that by 2025, which is 11 years away, three elections away, the proportion of the electorate, of the electorate, not the population, but the electorate, that will be 60 or over will be 49%. So one out of every two voters by the 2025 election will be age 60 or over. With all the issues that affect um, people age 60 and over um, being thrust, thrust in front of the uh, politicians in the most powerful way. So stand by for the next government, the next couple of governments to be really looking to woo the over 60s. Um, it's a good opportunity to get what you want from the politicians, I would, uh, I would venture to suggest. And uh, on the program that I do, which is called Agenda, uh, we've, we've, we've done a lot of interviews about dementia and uh, um, Beth Britton, who is our, uh, who's our first speaker today, Beth, uh, Beth was uh, one of the people that I interviewed, gave an absolutely fantastic interview. And, uh, and we've recently done um, several interviews about two new guides that have been produced from Age UK and Dementia Friends, covering what to do if diagnosed with dementia and about caring for those with dementia. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that is adding to the, to the great range of information that is available from these marvelous organizations that, uh, I, I, that you've all been looking at and that, that are li lining the wall of the room, of the room here. Um, the, um, the third thing and final thing I would say is, is again something Mark touched on which is the, the so-called good news argument that I, that I put forward 21 years ago. And I was arguing that, that when we look at the news of the day, it tends to be incredibly negative. I remember somebody, I think it was Simon Jenkins, when he was editing The Times, he came up to me one day and said, um, he said, you know, he said, I was watching the nine o'clock news as it then was last night, and I had to switch off after the fourth story because the body count was too high. And it is absolutely true. And, and now there are, in those days, you had 23, 25 million people watching one of the main evening news bulletins. Now that number is down to 11 million at the most, which means that 40 million people in this country are not watching a main evening news program. They're getting their news from the internet or they're not watching it um, at all. So um, I've now developed the, 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 my argument was that you should balance the stories about failure and about the negative things that are happening in society, about things going wrong, that you should balance it with stories about success and achievement. And we all know that as far as the whole issue of dementia is concerned, it's usually the negative stories that make the headlines. And that, that means that the reading public or the watching public is, is uh, deprived in many ways of some of the incredible amount of research that is going on to try to tackle the problem, whether it be to freeze the condition of dementia at the stage it is at, or whether it is then eventually after that uh, to, find a, to find a cure. And uh, one of the arguments that I've recently been putting forward is for something called solutions-driven journalism. And I would urge you to get in touch with your local newspapers and, and ask them to push something like this, because um, my argument is that if you accept that 90% of stories are negative in a newspaper, and it's, it's certainly true of the national press, perhaps less so of regional newspapers, 90% are negative, then when the editor of uh, that newspaper sends a reporter out on a story, he should require that reporter to find out what individuals are doing to tackle the problem represented by the negative headline, and to put um, at least a few paragraphs about that into the body of the story. And that would be a win-win, because the editors would get their negative headline, which they think, I think mistakenly, sells the newspaper, but the reader, viewer, listener would not be left with the feeling that the world is going down the plug hole. And solutions-driven journalism is, I think, the answer to everyone having what they want. And it doesn't require a huge amount of effort on the part of journalists, and I you know, very much hope that we will be moving in that direction as some organizations like the Huffington Post uh, already are. So uh, basically what impresses me about today's conference is that it is all about 
it's, it, it's yes, discussing the issues, but it's all about looking at solutions as well. And by bringing together all the disparate groups that are coming at dementia in different ways, from people who are affected by dementia to those doing research, to those who are campaigning, to carers, people who are looking after people with dementia, I think it gives us all a very good opportunity to have a very strong perspective um, when we go away from this conference today, uh, an update, if you like, on everything that is happening in this particular area. Now, we've got Q and a, a big Q&A session planned for after lunch. And if you would like to, during lunch, come up to me with your questions, either I can write them down, or if you want to write them down on a bit of paper um, and give them to me, then we can make sure that the panel, which will consist of not only the speakers who are here this morning, but a couple of other people as well, we can make sure that we get all your questions answered in what I think could be a very, very interesting session. It doesn't stop you thinking up questions or, or putting up your hand because you want to make a comment uh, on, on, on something you have heard the panel say. Uh, of course you can do that. Um, but if you would like to throw me some questions, then that would be, uh, that would be much appreciated. So, um, on with our conference. And uh, our first speaker is uh, a remarkable lady who uh, I was privileged to interview, as I was saying earlier, on, uh, on the wireless. Um, Beth Britton's father had vascular dementia for 19 years, starting when Beth was 12. He went 10 years without a diagnosis, and then he spent nine years in three different care homes until he passed away in April 2012 at the age of 85. Now, this experience has made Beth a formidable campaigner for dementia care support, understanding and research, not least through her blog, which is D4 Dementia, the letter for D4 Dementia. Her work, has, her work has brought her to the attention of some extremely influential people, and she was invited to the G8 Dementia Summit uh, last December, where she had tea with the Prime Minister. She is uh, a BRACE ambassador, of course, and has had a strong relationship with the charity since she found out about its work and uh, contacted BRACE in 2012. And uh, she has followed in her father's footsteps by supporting Arsenal, but, <laughs> but not everyone can get everything right in life, actually. So, uh, so Beth, where are you? Up you come. Great. Great. Many thanks, Martin. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you here. Wow, it actually looks like a massive audience when you stood up here. It's fantastic. It's, it's great that you've all turned up, particularly now the weather's definitely turned more wintry. I'd like to begin my session this morning by showing you um, a short film. I think it'll provide a useful introduction to anyone who is not familiar with my work. Um, and I need to work out how to make the technology work. Um, basically, the film was going to summarise um, a lot of what Martin um, has already said um, and go on to explain about the fact that actually, um, although my dad had dementia, um, I would have had him back in a heartbeat because um, he was an amazing man and dementia didn't take that away from him. So, um, in order for you to actually be able to watch this film in the future, um, you can actually go onto my website. How do I get the PowerPoint back up? Can you stick the PowerPoint back up for me? Thank you. Um, yeah, you can go onto my website, bethbritton.com, and you can actually see the film. It's only two minutes, um, and yeah, hopefully you've actually got some audio at home that's going to work for you. So, um, the film has told you a little bit, or would have told you a little bit about my personal background, um, but perhaps hasn't explained quite so well why I'm here today, and Martin's already summarised um, some of that for you. So, shortly after my dad passed away, I began my D for Dementia blog, and due to the success of that, my work has split into four main areas, campaigning, consultancy, writing, and blogging. In autumn 2013, I was awarded Best Independent Voice on Older People's Issues at the Older People in the Media Awards. And as you've seen, or you would have seen from the film, I was involved in the G8 Dementia Summit. However, most notably today, I'm speaking to you as an ambassador for BRACE. 
It was a very unexpected honour to be asked to become an ambassador. It's the first time I've ever been asked to become an ambassador for a charity, and I really hope I can live up to the expectations of Mark and, and his team. Since my last time in Bristol was just over a year ago, it was for the debate that we had on the 3rd of October last year, I thought by way of some scene setting um, for today, it would be helpful to go through some of the um, milestones that have occurred since then, um, particularly in relation to national um, and international issues. So, as we've already discussed, we've had the G8 Dementia Summit. That happened um, in December last year. Um, and there was also a follow-up legacy event in London in June. Um, the legacy event included an address from the World Dementia Envoy, Dr Dennis Gillings, who's on your screen there. Um, and it also included presentations from members of the World Dementia Council. Um, I think a lot of people share my unease with the fact that actually the council doesn't currently include anyone who is living with dementia, and I very much hope that in the future that may change. Um, in terms of the remit of the council, it's a global council, independent from governments, and they're tasked with stimulating innovation and development of life-enhancing drugs, treatments and care for people with dementia. And of course, the focus on research is particularly important given the um, work that BRACE do. Um, moving to the domestic agenda, um, Public Health England have launched their Dementia Intelligence Network, which follows on from the success of the Cancer Network. The role of the Dementia Network is to collate and disseminate data about different aspects of dementia care and support in order to inform policymakers and commissioners about the statistics that lie behind people's experiences of living with dementia and, of course, also caring for a loved one with dementia. Last September, I'm sure many of you saw the headlines, we had two really big reports from the Alzheimer's Society that gave um, updated figures for cost um, and prevalence of dementia. And I thought it'd be worth running through a few of those figures. So you can see on the screen, dementia costs the UK 26.3 billion a year. Um, and we've also given an interesting comparison um, in relation to the cost that's borne by families, 17.4 billion as opposed to 8.8 .8 billion um, borne by the state. And, and the comparison was really made between if you're diagnosed with, for example, cancer, the vast majority of your treatment falls within um, the NHS, and so therefore it is free um, at the point of, of use, whereas for people with dementia, their needs generally are much more social care-based, and of course social care is means-tested, hence why that huge cost to families and, and people who are living with dementia. In terms of prevalence, we were told that by the next general election, 850,000 people will be living with dementia, and that's predicted to rise to over 2 million um, by 2051. And that 225,000 people develop dementia a year, which is roughly one person every three minutes. So in the time that I was messing around trying to get a film to work, somebody was probably diagnosed with dementia. So that gives you some idea of, of the numbers of people that we're talking about. A couple more statistics from the report. Um, this is an absolutely astronomical figure, really eye-watering. 1,340,000,000 hours were spent caring for people with dementia in 2013 by family and friends and neighbours, unpaid care. Um, and we were told that equates to more than 150,000 years. That is a massive amount of caring time. And I'm sure there are many carers in the audience this morning if previous BRACE events are anything to go by. And then finally, from the Alzheimer's Society reports, um, I wanted to pick out, um, obviously, a stat on research, given that BRACE are our hosts today. Um, dementia costs over 30,000 per person with dementia each year but only £90 per person is spent on research. And that really highlights the fact that um, successive governments really haven't invested in researching dementia in the way that they have other conditions, hence why we are considerably um, far behind in, in terms of, of innovation, um, treatments, um, etc. Going back to sort of the point about care, um, there was a really important report published by the Care Quality Commission last month. It was called Cracks in the Pathway, and it looked at the care 
um, people living with dementia receive as they go between care homes and acute hospitals. And absolutely alarmingly, it concluded, oh, it concluded that the quality of care for people living with dementia varies greatly. It is likely that someone living with dementia will experience poor care at some point while living in a care home or being treated in hospital. So just to repeat that, that's pretty much every single person who's living with dementia can expect to receive an episode of poor care during their life with dementia. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that incredibly troubling and something that we really need to get a handle on um, in terms of the future. Finally, in my roundup, um, a bit of a nod to the past and to the future, really. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of the um, National Dementia Strategy. It was a five-year strategy published in 2009. Um, and the follow-up document, the Prime Minister's Challenge on Dementia in 2012. Now, both of those documents will have expired by the time of the next election. And it's my personal view that dementia needs to remain really high on the political agenda, really harking back to what Martin was saying about the fact that issues affecting older people um, are absolutely pivotal and will become pivotal to politicians in the future. I'd very much like to see cross-party support for a new strategy or something similar that sets out the priorities people with dementia and their carers have and how politicians and policymakers are going to meet those priorities. In my view, that, that is the way um, we should be looking at things now. Anyway, enough about the big picture. As we all know, by far the most significant impact that's been felt within the world of dementia has been to the individuals who've been diagnosed with a type of dementia and their families who've shared in that news. I cannot stress enough that a dementia diagnosis affects the whole family. And my first guests onto the platform to discuss their personal experiences know this only too well. Please extend a very warm welcome to Chris Roberts and his wife, Jane. Can I make this move on, please? Technology has failed us today. Thank goodness you two are here. Two very friendly faces for me, which is lovely. So, first of all, thank you both so much for coming to Bristol to join us today. Um, Chris, I'd like to start with you. Um, I'd like to begin asking you a little bit about your life before dementia. What did you enjoy doing and how would you have described yourself? I'm 53 years old. We run a property rental business of our own. Um, we've, been we've been doing that for about 20 years now, but I, my passion was motorcycles. I used to build motorcycles. I had my own fabrication shop. Um, I used to build them uh, uh, for customers and build my own. And I used to do a big dra drag racing, um, love speed. And I used to show me bikes all over Europe and ride them all over Europe. So that's a little bit of insight into what we are. We've, we've got a big family. We've got five children, a couple of grandchildren. And we, we, most Sundays, we have more around to dinner. So I'm a bit of a family man, a bit of a, a biker, or used to be. And we've got a, um, a family-run business as well. When did you start noticing symptoms of dementia? Well, I've got emphysema. Um, so we self-diagnosed when I started getting a bit scatty and forgetting words, um, forgetting where I was going, getting lost in the car, I was putting it all down to lack of oxygen because I, I likened myself to a mountaineer. I thought, well, they, they, they get giddy and they get a little bit, forget words and things like that. So we, we were quite happy with that explanation. And so we just muddled along. And um, I also thought, well, maybe it's my age. Um, becoming a bit of a Victor Meldrew, mood swings, things like that. Um, and then I thought, well, maybe it's the wife. <laughs> <coughs> um, so we, we just we just muddled along, and it was only in a routine um, checkup with my chest at the doctor's that we, we we mentioned it, and she went, "Good gracious, no, that's not part of emphysema," and the uh, diagnosis process started. 
which was really going to be my next question about how your diagnosis came about. How long did it actually take you to get a diagnosis um, and how old were you when you were diagnosed? Uh, I was um, 50? 51. Yeah, 51 when I actually got diagnosed. The diagnosis process took 13 months, which actually, talking to other people, was quite quick. Um, throughout that whole process, we were given no support whatsoever, offered any, any, any information, um, nothing, nothing. Um, we were just left to our own devices. Um, we had an idea what it might be. We've got Alzheimer's in the family. So we did a little bit of research ourselves, but we were left in limbo for 13 months. Um, and that, that was quite a harrowing time actually, wasn't it? Because we didn't know whether it was a brain tumor, which Jane was quite hoping for because that's operable, <coughs> a chance of recovery, or whether it was something like Alzheimer's. And when we were actually given the diagnosis, we actually felt relieved because at last we had a label. That's going to be my next question. <laughs> you can tell I've prepped you ever so well. Um, how did you feel about hearing the news that you had dementia? I mean, you say you felt relieved, but at the same time also, did you realise what a diagnosis of dementia was going to mean for you? We had no idea what the diagnosis was going to mean because even as we were getting told the diagnosis, a knock came on the consultant's door and a um, lady popped her head around the corner and she said... Um, would you mind hurrying up? There's someone way in the waiting room getting anxious. So we had no idea what a diagnosis meant because we were hurried out the room and we were sent packing with my welcome folder. Um, I hope it was just a one-off. I, I really hope it was. So we got home. Um, Jane cried. She got about, she told the rest of the family and started um, planning our last holiday because we knew absolutely nothing. The welcome pack got put on the side, and I think it remained there for six months um, while we got our heads around it. Um, in the meantime, because I'm under 65, we didn't have any direct access to the memory clinic, so we were assigned um, a CPN. The CPN was on holiday for four weeks. So um, we had this limbo of absolute nothingness, nothingness, and it was a very scary time. So pretty terrible post-diagnostic support because it was non-existent, in other words. Um, and in my wider work, I have to say, I do hear that same story repeatedly. So sadly, I don't think your experiences were a one-off. In an ideal world, Chris, what sort of post-diagnostic support would you have wanted? Oh, and in an ideal world, what, what would I? I've got a list as long as you're on. Um, I think as soon as it's mentioned in the doctors, you should be assigned some kind of dementia advisor. Um, you should be assigned to a peer support network of people waiting to be diagnosed. So you're all sharing the same problems. You should be given information along the way. And that's before you even get to a diagnosis. On diagnosis, you should be taken to a separate room afterwards where you can discuss it in comfort. Um, you should have a social worker there, an OT. <laughs> and all the people that are going to come to you along this journey, as it were, I hate the word journey, but they are, they should all be in the room, joined up services. Wow, wouldn't that be wonderful? But to have someone else with dementia there as well, to have a little bit of support to support, to ask them, someone that's actually caring for someone maybe, so we can ask them questions, um, to be offered um, more information as regards courses for myself and for Jane. Um, she's the one that's going to have to look after me. She notices more things than I do. So in a wonderful world, yeah, I've got a list as long as you're on. I thought you might have. <laughs> How has being diagnosed as a younger person impacted upon your life? So particularly looking at things like work, family, hobbies and friends. How, how's, what's the impact been like into your wider life? Um, I just want to say straight away that the impact of a diagnosis doesn't vary from age to age. I think there's no age discrepancy there. And I don't believe in the 65 rule anyway, but there you go, that's another matter. There's no 65 rule in regards to cancer treatment. There shouldn't be any with dementia. Um, the impact, going back to your question, um, as I've said, was, was just... Um, I lost my licence, um, I lost my independence... Um, I struggle to work, 
Um, I lost a lot of friends, but that wasn't the illness. A lot of people blame losing their friends on illness. Because I lost my license, because I couldn't drive anymore, I couldn't also ride my motorbike anymore. So I didn't move in the same circles anymore. So a lot of friends I lost were down to not moving in them circles anymore, which was down to the illness. It, but it wasn't because of dementia. Um, it was, it was, we didn't know where to look, left or right or forwards. We had no idea, absolutely no idea. Um, I decided how many other people knew nothing about dementia, as, as little as we knew. So I decided there and then to try and be forthright, be, be outspoken and proactive, as my wife just says, I forget words. So I actually put a status on Facebook. Some of you might like Facebook, some of you might not. And I thought that was an instant way of telling everyone I knew and more about the dementia, about dementia and what it entails. And I put a short, brief description. And I also put that it's not age specific. And I asked for no replies. And anyone did reply, I actually deleted. But it was a quick way of getting out there. It's, um, it's horrendous. No one can prepare you for the diagnosis. No one can prepare you. We had 13 months to prepare for it, and we still weren't prepared. Yeah, the hard part is the, the disbelief from myself, my family, and other people. Um, it's about being too young, what people think. The, for the amount of times that I've been told, really? If I had a pound for every time I've been told, really? Amazing. Um, yeah, so it, it's very, very hard. But with the right support, which you do find along the way, it's not signposted very easily. We'll probably get into that later. But it, it's, it's difficult. I'm really glad you've touched on social media because we're going to move to some of the really positive stuff that's happened for you um, since diagnosis. Now, you and I first met via Twitter, if you can meet on Twitter. And I'd like to talk to you about some of the things you've been doing as a person living with dementia online and in person, beginning with Dementia Friends. We're both wearing our badges. You very kindly gave me a Welsh badge, actually. I feel very honoured, and I'm actually wearing it today. Um, how did you get involved with Dementia Friends and, and how, what impact has it had on your life? Well, I decided there must be more. Where's all this information? So, social media straight away, um, Google. And then I started finding all these groups. Mainly, mainly were on Facebook, to be honest. And then there was networks on Twitter. So I got my 16-year-old to teach me how to do Twitter. Um, Facebook was quite easy. <laughs> And I just started getting involved, and it became my, my window on the world, as it were. Um, I then became quite active, decided to become active, because how many other people didn't know anything? Um, I got involved with the Purple Angels, and then I got involved, and I thought, there's got to be more. So I got involved. I saw Dementia Friends, and I thought, right, let's go and pick some holes in this, because I'm an expert in dementia. I'm actually an only an expert in my own dementia, but, you know, we live and learn. Um, I fiddled my postcode, because it wasn't in Wales at the time. So I went over to England after fiddling my postcode, took Jane with me, my driver, um, just in case I forgot as well. And it was actually a very good little session for people who didn't know anything. I really enjoyed it. Very proudly wore my badge after that and set about um, doing as many sessions as I could. could. We've recently <laughs> done one for the Plaid Cymru Conference, um, which was very well received. I think I've made 250 friends up to now. So it's a little bit, but it's it adding. There's 5,000 dementia friends now. But that's what's more important, is putting the community spirit back, is what dementia friends does. It tells you not to be scared about asking people, can I help you? We're too busy these days. We've, we've forgotten how to ask, can I help? But it also gave me my confidence back after I was told I couldn't do anything anymore. And with having that confidence, I then became a bigger... Um, advocate on social media. Um, do I go further? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about um, Dementia Action Alliance. Uh, sorry, Dementia Alliance International, also Dementia Mentors. In between my cough. <coughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about both of those organisations, Chris? Yeah, I got involved in quite a lot of um, <coughs> support groups, things like that. I then got involved in a closed support group just for people with dementia. No carers, no professionals. It was just a closed group for, <laughs> for, for people diagnosed or maybe not diagnosed, but, but heading that way. 
and, it, and we all got together and we all decided, it was, an, it was an international group, and we decided to set up our own group, which is Dementia Alliance International. Nothing about us without us, is a motto. Um, it's built and built and built. I'm now on the board of directors um, for that group. Um, we're trying to set about things like um, guidelines for the media with all the words that they use. Martin was saying before about some of the horror stories, but well, it's also the, the horrific words they use. Um, there's nothing about living well with dementia. Um, Dr. Shibley Rahman recently done a survey of all the words used in the G8 summit, living well dementia wasn't used once. So Dementia Alliance International is about that, promoting guidelines and giving people with dementia a voice. There's only one person in that group that hasn't got dementia, the rest of us have. And we're trying to speak at all the big conferences and trying to give dementia a voice and also trying to promote the human rights side as well and to stop discrimination about people with dementia. Any funding we do is purely for the members to attend conferences. Um, and then get involved with another group called Dementia Mentors, which is um, mainly by two Americans. Um, a guy called Gary Blank, his father, um, he cared for his father. After his father died, he started doing what Beth did. He was a really big activist in dementia awareness now, and he's promoting wristbands in America, and he's promoting other stuff for... Um, police and stuff like that. And there's another guy called Harry Urban, who is, um, he runs a support group called Forget Me Nots, where they got together. And after talking to people with dementia, we brought up, um, we come up with a website aimed specifically at people with dementia, but other people can use it. And it's actually a good model for other areas and other countries to use. Um, it's dementia friendly, the whole website, but the main part of it is there's a video section and we encourage people with dementia to make videos. Um, we help them, encourage them to make them. It's used with a free software, so it doesn't cost anything. It's three minute videos to try and help other people with dementia on any subject that they may think might be helpful. Last week, that page, just that video page, had 12,000 hits, and the video section hasn't been running long. From there, we started doing um, peer support you can fill in a form and you can be matched up with someone of a similar age with a similar illness and you can talk one-to-one -one and discuss stuff. And from there, we've led to online virtual CAFs. We started off with one. We're now doing three in different time zones. And we're talking about doing maybe another one for carers or families of people who are diagnosed and maybe another one in another time zone. Peer support is what people with dementia value the most, talking to other people. And it's been really worthwhile. And the people that come on there, are really they really praise it so much. A lot of them have gone on to run their own pages now, specialist pages on, on um, Louis Bodies, um, Lupus, and things like that now, because it's given them the confidence to carry on. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, as we're here today as guests of BRACE, um, can you tell us why funding um, into research for different types of dementia is so important to you as a person who's living with dementia? Yeah, people forget about all the, all the research. The research is major, major. We, we need to find, we need to understand uh, uh, if through research, we can, we can then put, pinpoint all the variants that cause dementia, all, all the hundred plus. We can then single them out and we can start to whittle them away and eventually head up, for, head up for this miraculous cure for dementia. So that's where research comes on. We need to understand all these different variants and all these different um, illnesses that produce that it's not just Alzheimer's, it's not just vascular. So that's where research is a major, major part uh, of, of all these breakthroughs and all these drugs that maybe in the beginning only hold it back, but they'll progress. And that's where we need more and more money put into this. Otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere. And that's where these figures, the stats are going up, the diagnosis rates are getting better. There's going to be more of me around. They've just gone from 17,000 to 44,000 in, 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 in a year because the diagnosis rates are going better for people under 65. It's not going to get better. So more and more money has to go into research, and then we can bring these figures down by controlling them, maybe. 
Fantastic, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, Jane, if I could ask you a few questions now. Um, when did you first notice changes in Chris? Well, Chris was having lots of changes that I never noticed. He was going to, as you said, we have a property business. He was going to houses to do work, the maintenance on the properties and getting lost. I didn't know this because he went on his own and he just thought it was one of those things. He was also um, going to a house, for example, to change a door. He'd buy the door, go to the house. He'd then go back to being q by the fittings, the hinges. He'd then come home and get his drill. He'd then come home and get the battery for the drill. All these things I didn't notice, they were, ongoing. They, they were going on for Chris before I had any idea. What I noticed with Chris was the fact that I got a change, I'm sure we've all got a change jar at home. The change jar was getting full a lot more quickly because he was always coming home with lots of change for me. We found out since the money was becoming an issue. He was paying with notes instead of having to sort the change. Even Chris didn't notice this change in himself. We only noticed that the change jar became full. And this is one of those symptoms, signs that we noticed after diagnosis. After diagnosis. We went back and thought, well, when did this start? And we, we then were able to pinpoint things years before. But at home, we were noticing that he was becoming Victor Meldrew. He was becoming argumentative. He's a very, very level-headed, gentle, very level-headed man, very intelligent. And we used to call him Kofi Annan because he was such an ambassador. If there was an issue in the house, Chris was the one that sought it. He was the fixer. So it was a personality or a behavioural change. Um, things like uh, uh, also having lots of change in his pocket, which. We just never put down to anything. I thought he was having a midlife crisis. I thought, you know, he's getting to that age now. It could be a midlife crisis. The same, the same as he thought for me. <laughs> How has Chris's diagnosis impacted upon your life as his wife? It's, it's um, changed everything around completely. It's had a major impact. It really has. When I say turned our household upside down, not in a negative way. I, I'm, I was so pleased with what Martin Lewis said this morning. We can hear too many of the horror stories, the awful stories, the awfulness of the disease, the dreadfulness. We don't need that. We need to see how people can, can live well. It has turned our family life upside down. I now am the sole driver in the house. If Chris needs to go somewhere, I take him. If our 16-year-old needs to go somewhere, I take her. If my mum needs to go somewhere, I have to accompany her as well. We can't share these jobs out anymore. If there's a problem in one of the houses, I have to go along to help find out what the problem is, what do we need to do. I take Chris along with me because he's still able to make an assessment of the problem, but my time is taken up having to accompany him, having to get in there, then having to arrange the workmen to come and fix the problems. That's all just what Chris used to do. I'm still having to do what I used to do, as well as take over what he used to do. He still does it, but he needs that extra support of me taking him there. We need to get um, another, another driver in the house. Our daughter's 17 soon. <laughs> now, um, you've got another family member who's living with dementia. Can you tell us a little bit more about your home life? Chris was diagnosed with dementia approximately, well, with one dementia two years ago. The formal diagnosis came um, 18 months ago for mixed dementia. In that time, uh, April this year, my mum was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and the decision was taken to move her in with us because we're already geared up for it. I could not, she only lives 15 minutes away from us, but I do not have that capacity of time to travel 15 minutes to check that she's okay, maybe half an hour there, however long it would take, and the 15 minutes back. I don't have that capacity of time, so we've had to move her in with us. Ironically, moving her in makes it easier for me to support her while she goes through this process. process. Now, I've heard you and Chris talk very passionately about um, the Dementia Action Alliance Carers Call to Action last month. Can you tell us a little bit more about why this call to action is so important? Well, a lot of the things, as Chris said, we've had no pre-diagnosis support. We've had no, hardly any post-diagnosis support. The CPN has, you know, we have her telephone number 24-7, seven, seven days a week. I'm afraid it only works nine to five sometimes. That's not uh, uh, um, anything against her. That's just the way it is. I need 
education. I need to know what's going to go on. I need to know what the process is. I need to know more about the condition. Because with that knowledge, with that, that understanding, I can tailor my management of Chris's condition and my mother's condition to suit them. Because they both have a similar diagnosis, but are two completely different... Um, different management techniques, for want of a better word. The Carers' Call to Action has been asking for this. They're asking for education for the carers, because with that knowledge, we can do a better job of supporting the person that we are the advocate for. I don't like the term carer. Um, I've been introduced to several people today as Chris's wife, because that's who I am. I'm Chris's wife. I happen to support him through this diagnosis. The Carers' Call to Action, who, who have... Um, a stall over there. One of their, their main points is give us the education that we need so that we can support support our, our diagnose. And in doing so, by supporting them in the best manner possible, I keep myself well, health, well healthy and I maintain uh, an even keel for a lot longer. Sorry. Yeah, and also the cause council action is giving carers a voice. It, because it, it, they've got a 20-point checklist that, that people need to follow to make sure that services are working correctly. And it's also about signposting, which calls Care to Action are actually shouting about, and about tailing care packages, because not everyone's got the same problems. And it's about having a care package that's um, uh, um, flexible, flexible. And, and they are being a voice for everyone out there, all these unpaid carers. They're also calling for the essential, uh, sorry, the recognition of the unique experience of the carers, of the, the, the person supporting the person with dementia. Every dementia is unique. The, 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 the way it presents, the way it's managed is unique. And the carers' call to action recognise that uniqueness of our position. I'm too, I, I am a carer, but I'm caring in two different ways. And that uniqueness needs to be recognised. That's another thing the carers' call for action are calling for. Um, by giving me the knowledge, giving me that recognition of the uniqueness and allowing me to be involved in the tailoring of the services for each of my carees, my, my diagnosed, um, <laughs> for want of a better phrase. I'm sorry, I'm not very politically correct. I'm, just, a, I'm just an ordinary person dealing with, with, with family. That will, uh, can help me to maintain my health and well-being because, as you've heard, I've got my husband with dementia at home. I've got my 78-year-old mother with dementia at home. We also have a 16-year-old daughter at home. If I am not well supported, and all the aims of the carer's call to action are all about supporting the carer, if I am not well supported, then I am going to need the help of the social services, of society in general. If I go down, you're having to look after me. You're also having to look after my husband, you're having to look after my mother, and you're having to ca take care of my 16-year-old daughter. The Carers' Call to Action points allow this one person to be supported in the best management, in, in the best way possible. I can then worry about the other three. So that's four of us out of the need for society to look after us all. Fantastic. Thank you. Finally, from both of you, I know that Chris has looked at, at care homes and occasionally um, has gone to one for a break. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you'd like to see the social care sector do for people who are living with dementia? I'd like to see um, joined up services. Um, I'm, I'm not particularly bothered about age appropriate services um, because you know, do you know what? We're all people. Um, 70 year olds. Uh, is it age appropriate for them to be mixing with 95 year olds? So it, it doesn't matter to me. I, I go to a care home um, and I, I, I encourage younger people with dementia to actually go to a care home because they don't know when they're going to need it. So let, let's, let's make the transition early. early. Let's, let's get used to it, you know. So, and also in visiting a care home, um, I can make sure that the standards are up to a standard because I have a bit more insight than some of the guys in there maybe. So, so it, to me, social care needs to be available. It needs to be there. there. It is, but it needs to be signposted better. And they need to speak to each other. 
We shouldn't have to wait for referrals and knowing who to ask. It should be there. It should be in place. It's all about care packages. What I would like to see is people that are in social care thinking laterally. One of the best pieces of support that we've had in this whole process is a bus pass. It's a bus pass plus one. Chris has now been diagnosed and he has a disabled blue badge. He has a dis disability label. With that label comes the fact that we can access a bus pass. Now, a bus pass, you know, it's just something so small, but that bus pass actually takes an awful lot of the stress off me. He has to, as, as Chris has said, he has to go out. He can't leave the house unaccompanied because he doesn't cross roads very... He doesn't cross roads at all. He just goes straight, straight across. By having the bus pass, this actually gives Chris independence. It's a plus one bus pass, and it means that I do not have to accompany Chris everywhere. I'm the sole driver in the house. My 16-year-old can take Chris to a doctor's appointment, a hospital appointment. She can go to the cinema with him, and I can be left at home. The bus pass allows his sister to go with him to a hospital appointment. This gives Chris independence from me. We love each other. We spend 24-7 together. But sometimes it's nice for him to spend time with someone else. So that very small thing, a simplistic bus pass, is such a huge benefit to us because sometimes we'll go out shopping and we'll take the bus. I can drive, I don't do a huge shop, but it's nice for me as the, the supporter, as Chris's advocate, to just sit back and not have to consider where are we driving, where am I going to park, how long am I parking here for. We can jump on the bus and we can go. And Chris is not being taken anywhere by his wife. We are going somewhere together. It's all a psychological thing. A lot of the way to see the good news st um, in, in, in these stories is a change of mindset. How can a bus pass help that? It takes one of the stresses off me and it gives Chris um, independence. He can go elsewhere with other people. <laughs> um, uh, also, with the social care aspect, we live in where, with the, the day respite care that Chris goes for. I don't want him to go for daycare. I think he should be with me. But I have to accept his autonomy and his decision making in that decision that he has made that he needs to go for respite care. He's doing it for me, but he also gets a rest. In Wales, we only have to pay £50 per week, regardless of your income, for any number of day respite cares. Now, where Chris goes to, it's £50 per day. But he can go into that, that, that um, care home several days per week. And I do not have to consider the financial implication for me. I don't believe this happens in England. This is something the Welsh Government have done. It's something that social care needs to, to, to look at because by taking the stresses, taking one of those, two of those small straws off my back, that allows me to live well for longer and you keep four of us safe for longer. Think laterally. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. We've run out of time, probably more than run out of time, actually. Um, but thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us today. I'm sure the audience have learnt a huge amount. So please, can we show our appreciation to Chris and Jane? Right, OK, now um, we are going to be running over quite significantly, so I'm going to have to sort of crack on a little bit. Um, I believe we have someone here from Bristol City Council. No? He hasn't turned up. Ah, fantastic! <laughs> you see, we were stalling for time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so please welcome onto the stage, um, I presume you're Mike Hennessy. Mike Hennessy, who is the Service Director for Care, Support and Provision at the People Department of Bristol City Council. Have a seat. Now, I don't want to massively eat into too much of Liz's time, so I think we're going to have to be quite, quite brief with the, the Q&A on this. But I wanted to start by asking you um, about the resources that you've created to help support people who are affected by dementia, specifically your Living Well with Dementia Strategy, um, and also the Carers document. I found both of them on your website. I was doing a bit of research. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the Council's thinking has developed since those documents were created and, and what you're doing for people with dementia now? 
Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for giving the opportunity to answer some questions about how Bristol City Council is supporting people with dementia and their families and carers. Uh, in terms of our Living Well with Dementia strategy, it's a really broad strategy, and it's managed by the Bristol Health and Wellbeing Board, which is chaired by the elected mayor of Bristol and Dr. Martin Jones, who's the uh, chairman of uh, Bristol Clinical Commissioning Group. So, uh, and there's good representation politically and professionally on the uh, Health and Wellbeing Board. And it's not just about health and social care, it's about better communities, safer communities, uh, places where people with dementia and their carers can live fulfilled lives. So at the heart of our strategy, uh, and this kind of goes beyond dementia, is helping people stay in their own homes for as long as they can, because that's what people want. I missed the conversation, I'm afraid, but... Um, uh, in terms of we, we've re-provided, so we've uh, created a community dementia service to support people in crisis, help them through times of particular stress, maybe illness, um, as well as helping people with able to kind of uh, dementia to be re-abled, so supporting them in their homes, giving the family some advice and help about um, how to live successfully. We've also been working with the independent sector to create three new dementia services, uh, residential respite and day services for people with dementia across the city. These will be state of the art offering up to 180 new beds for people with dementia. Um, technologically, they'll be probably some of the best in the country. We're working with Stirling University. In terms of carers, we've got a great service offering short breaks to carers in the form of direct payments. Very simple assessment, making sure carers get access to those absolutely crucial breaks. Now, we're always hearing that we live in times of austerity. It seems to be the, the number one word at the moment. How have cutbacks affected the care and support that you provide for people who are living with dementia and their families? Um, no director of social services would say that we've not been impacted by the austere measures that have been we've had to implement, and Bristol City Council's uh, no different than that. Although they have moved very, we have worked to protect uh, much of the social care spend. So what we've spent a lot of time doing is moving from expensive service models. So, for example, we had ten care homes, which were old-fashioned; uh, they were expensive to maintain. Um, they weren't very fully occupied, and we've reprovided those now with better services, more locally based, which people use when they need them, not having sort of 30 or 40 beds, maybe 10 or 15 or 20 of those empty. So we've worked on being more efficient, on finding better ways to do things to save the money. It's not about dementia, but for example, we've helped maybe 50 people who lived in care homes younger people move out of those care homes into supported living and that saves about £10,000 a year per person and people are getting much better independent lives but that means we've got money to reinvest. Unfortunately you missed um, my sort of little roundup, and I did look at the CQC cracks in the pathway report which I'm sure you're aware of. I was wondering how um, the council are actually working with the Care Quality Commission to address um, issues of poor care in Bristol. Uh, so we work really closely with the Care Quality Commission and there are two sorts of issues here. There's the time when we have to intervene when something's gone wrong and we all know of awful stories where things go wrong in care services. Um, and we've created with uh, the Clinical Commissioning Group, the NHS locally, the council have created a team of support staff who we can put into services very quickly should we identify that things have gone wrong to help lift the service and make sure people are safe. In terms of being proactive, we've got a quality assurance team in Bristol and we've just appointed a service manager for quality assurance and contracts to oversee that team because we have had some issues about quality uh, in care services in the, Bristol, in the Bristol area. So we're working with the Care Quality Commission on their new inspection regime, which is I think much more transparent for people to see and make choices about where they're looking at the outcomes for people so in terms of is the home well led is it effective is it safe is it caring and is it responsive to people's needs and if if those services aren't then cqc will be making that very clear and we can work with them to improve the quality of services um so in short a lot of work's going on there fantastic 
Um, I was also interested to know what you've been doing around dementia-friendly communities. We hear about this a lot. Um, uh, you would have missed Chris telling us that he's a Dementia Friends champion. Um, so I was wondering whether your council staff have had Dementia Friends training and also whether the council's considered becoming an accredited um, dementia-friendly community. We are aiming to be a dementia-friendly city. I'm a dementia friend. I had a dilemma today. Did I wear my dementia friend badge or a poppy? And I decided it was the dementia friend badge. <laughs> Um, I could have worn both, perhaps. I wasn't sure of the etiquette. Um, so, yeah, we've got a strategy to create, um, working across a whole range of areas. We, we are becoming a city of service. We're encouraging people to be volunteers. We're really working with all of our staff. The council employs thousands of people to uh, help them make that little bit of difference to people with dementia. So being a dementia friend means perhaps being a bit patient. If somebody's in the queue in front of you, being aware of what's going on around you. One of our staff I know uh, contacted us because they bumped into somebody in the street who seemed a bit confused and they phoned us up through our care direct service and we were able to support that person, get them back home and settled and safe. So that's kind of some of the examples of awareness raising. But of course the council also has far bigger reach than our own staff. So, you know, we want to influence and work across business and communities across the city to encourage people to be more friendly towards dementia. I think the council view is if we get it right for older people and older people with dementia, then that kind of affects and impacts on the quality of life for everybody. Fantastic. Um, two very, very quick questions, um, because we have overrun a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about the CARE Act? This is the big piece of legislation that's obviously going to be impacting, um, I'm sure, many, many people in the audience. Um, how is the council preparing for the CARE Act, um, which is majority implementation um, by April next year? Uh, we have a programme manager who's very experienced at working on health and social care leading the programme. Um, the guidance came out, I think, about 10 days ago, so we're still working our way through that. And there are some things in that we hadn't expected. Like, one of the things that I'm really pleased about is councils and others have got statutory responsibility for adult safeguarding. That begins to put us on a par with children's services, uh, although we're very late to the game, but that really strengthens the relationship and the duties that people have. Part of that now seems to be self-neglect. Um, and there's a big kind of conversation about at what point is somebody losing capacity to make decisions or the rights, as we assume people have got the right to independent lives and choices. Um, the work we're doing with the market, we have to produce a market position statement which will inform people who want to use services of what those services are like. Um, we're concerned about the financial impact, like every council that I'm in contact with is worried about how we're going to deliver this and the impact on carers. So we'll be talking to our partnership boards across the city, which cover older people, people who learn difficulties, carers and sensory impairment and mental health, to make sure that we involve people in how we develop our approach to the Care Act. Fantastic, Mike. Just to finish then, um, what would be your message for people who are living with dementia in Bristol and their carers in terms of what the council will do for them today, tomorrow and into the future? Um, I'm sure the diagnosis of dementia for the individual and the relatives and carers and loved ones must be a difficult and devastating diagnosis. My message is uh, Bristol's working hard to make sure that everybody in the city recognises the issues for people with dementia. I think we diagnosed two and a half thousand people. There are probably another two and a half thousand people at least waiting or haven't got a diagnosis. We've got some brilliant services. Um, there's a lot people can do with early intervention to minimise the devastating impact of this disease. Um, and we've got some fantastic staff who will work with you and your family through the whole course of your, 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 your care journey from diagnosis to uh, end of life care, if that's what's necessary. And, you know, our commitment is to work with you to help you as, have as good experience as you can and your carers. Many thanks. Well, we've we've more than run out of time, but um, a massive thank you to to Mike, to Chris, and to Jane for their time this morning. And I hope you found what they've had to say really useful. If you could give them a really warm round of applause, thank you. And Mike, I'm going to take this opportunity to give you one of those. We were talking about it before you came in, but it's all about the carers' call to action. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, Beth, thanks very much indeed for, uh, for chairing that inspiring session. And I have to say that, that that is the most articulate expression that I have ever heard 
from Chris and Jane of just taking us through the whole process of dementia, from diagnosis to what you're dealing with now. I think it's fantastic. I think we should give them another round of applause. <laughs> And it's, and it's also great to hear how, how you're doing in Bristol because you really have got to be at the forefront of dealing with the whole issue of dementia. And, and that's great to see. And I know the Rowntree Foundation and others have been, have been working on projects to make towns and cities dementia friendly, um, which, is, which is just a terrific thing to do so that the whole concept of dementia is ingrained into the DNA of every aspect of the city or town. So. You guys, sounds to me as though you guys are pretty well top of the tree on that. So congratulations uh, to Bristol on that front. So as I said, we're, we're looking at all different aspects of dimension. I think the one that really, really sort of grabs us, all, all of us in this room at the moment, um, is the whole question of scientific research and what the latest is on the research that is going on in different ways to dementia. And we're going to hear now from Liz Coulthard who is a neurologist and consultant senior lecturer at South Mead Hospital. She's got a special interest in cognition and dementia, and since 2011 has been the leader of the clinical research team formerly based at the Brace Centre in Frenchay. The team is rebranding, I gather, as the Remember Group Research into Memory Brain Sciences of Dementia and is still extensively supported by Brace. I'm delighted to see that Liz has recently started commenting for the Science Media Centre to give a more balanced view of science stories uh, in the media, which will keep Chris and Jane very happy as well. Um, but Liz is, uh, she's the mother to a toddler called Lottie. Um, before the demands of motherhood, she was a member of the New Bristol Symphonia, where she lays claim to being the second worst violinist. <laughs> uh, now, I don't know if she's going to play anything for us today. No, definitely not. We're, we're, we're being spared that. Uh, but we are going to hear a lot about your, your cutting-edge scientific research. So uh, over to you, Liz. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much to Brace for inviting me to speak today. I have the privilege really of being both a clinician seeing patients with dementia, so we deny, d diagnose dementia. Um, every, every week we diagnose new patients with <coughs> dementia um, but, and also um, doing research into dementia. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing here in Bristol and to some extent how that fits in with research more widely. The IT would have to go quite seriously wrong before I play the violin. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, we've just decided after much voting and brainstorming and uh, asking people to call ourselves the Remember Group. Um, some of the members of the group are here um, and uh, we are a group of neurologists, psychologists and some non-clinical researchers um, working on dementia and also Huntington's disease. So uh, I run a clinic in Huntington's disease and we have a research programme in Huntington's disease, but I'm not actually going to mention that, but I'm very ha happy to talk about it later. We're based here in the building on the right, and that's our new Southmead Hospital, the super hospital, one of the biggest hospitals in Europe. And this is what it should look like and what it will look like um, when the bit, all the bits are finished. So we've got a few... Um, other buildings around that, um, and things that need to be knocked down, but it's um, quite an impressive structure. If not working, it's, it's, there are a few glitches, shall we say, but we won't go into those now. We are actually, though, going to be based come next March or April in a new facility that's currently being refurbished um, in somewhere called Elgar House, and this will allow us to have a purpose. Um, refurbished place where we can do research into dementia and Huntington's disease and we're very grateful to Brace who are um, critical to development of that service. Um, so where do we fit in? So the Remember group, what, what do we do that's different from other research groups? Well you may know that there's absolutely fantastic world-leading laboratory research in Bristol. <coughs> Um, that I put some key players in this at the bottom. Um, so Pat Kehoe, uh, Seth Love and Laura Palmer from the Dementia Research Group. 
They hold a brain bank, so they have a huge number of brains from people who've had dementia that are used for research, and they also do laboratory work, trying to understand what happens in the brain of patients who've had dementia. So that's ongoing and very successful in Bristol. There's also, a, 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 again, a really high quality um, e epidemiology and public health research in Bristol. And I'd say we sort of fit in between. So our research is on individual people. We are trying to develop treatments, trying to understand the, the disease better, trying to um, diagnose things better and more quickly. And all the research that we do involves people. So sometimes our research involves people with dementia, sometimes it involves healthy elderly people who um, are at a similar age to those who have got dementia. Um, and sometimes we run studies on younger people because we also are trying to understand how the brain works because it's still a, a fairly mysterious organ despite all the research that's done on the brain. Um, we still have a way to go before we fully understand how the brain works. So we're doing all these things. We're trying to particularly focus on memory, understand the processes behind memory, and then we're trying to implement clinical trials so that when you see an in, uh, individual patient, you can diagnose them as early as possible and then give them a targeted treatment. That's what we're trying to do. Um, we, we, I would say we're not there yet, but that's what we're trying to do. And as part of that, we run a service. So we see patients every week with dementia and diagnose them. And all those patients are offered any research opportunities that we may have at the time. And I just put those arrows to remind me to say that we could not do this independently, and these different research strands are not independent. So we work very closely with the dementia research group doing the laboratory research, and one of the trials I'm going to tell you about actually comes directly from laboratory work, so it's absolutely bench to bedside. They did some work on the, on the brains from post-mortem samples in the laboratory. It suggested that a drug may be helpful in dementia, and we're now doing a clinical trial in dementia. So it's so important to have close relations with the, the different research groups. Okay, so for our group, um, we've already heard about the broader challenge for dementia. We, the, the government set up some priorities in 2012, and there's a big dementia challenge, but what are we doing that's, that, in, our, in our world of sort of like clinical research? Well, we want to diagnose people early. We want to try and develop better tests so that we can give people an answer as early as possible. We've already seen what an impact a delay in diagnosis can have, how stressful that is. And there's another argument for early diagnosis, which is that the earlier we treat people, the better. If we can get treatments that actually slow or halt the disease, which we hope to do, it's much better to give them earlier on. So I'm going to come back to that later, but that's one of our main aims, is early diagnosis. We also are trying to develop disease-modifying therapies. <coughs> so I think there's, a, there's become a feeling about dementia that we don't really have any good treatments. And that does lead to a bit of a sense of loss of hope, I think, that we couldn't have treatments. But I sort of think back to what I know of time before things like penicillin and times before treatment of heart attacks. And if we had a loss of hope then, if we thought, well, nothing's really going to work, so let's not try, <coughs> We wouldn't have come up with these things. So my feeling is that we should actually aim for a cure. Now, I don't want to give false hope. We certainly don't have a cure at the moment. But if we can slow down the disease a bit, that's, that's a step in the right direction. And if we could halt the disease, that would be even better. So by taking small, sensible steps, not... Um, not trying, trying not to get these reports as hugely overblown headlines that's been, been touched on already, um, I think is, is a rational way to try and develop treatments for dementia. So, and then we've got people who have dementia now. So we're not going to have a cure in the next five years, I don't think. Um, so what can we do to, with drugs, so with pharmacological agents, how can we improve quality of life? So in that way, we want to act in a similar way to a bus pass that's already been mentioned. We want to make life better for people now. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. Those are our challenges. And I just want to talk a little bit about how we're going about them. So we've already touched on why do we want to diagnose people early. And this picture just shows the difference between 
someone who's not had dementia and someone who's had dementia. So you can see that there's a big difference in the size and the structure of the brain. And we know from looking down the microscope that as the brain changes, um, some of the cells die, and also there are extra things that we can see down the in the brain. So we can see amyloid plaques, which are labelled, and also these things called neurofibrillary tangles. There's a lot of debate as to whether it's amyloid or the tangles that are the primary problem, uh, and we don't really know. We also know there's a lot of problems in blood vessels, so people's blood vessels do not look normal in most types of dementia. Um, and, this, uh, and this particular pathology relates to Alzheimer's disease, which is the commonest type, and 90% of people with Alzheimer's disease, their blood vessels are not normal. So there are three, at least three things. There's amyloid accumulation, neurofibrillary tangles, and blood vessels not quite working. <coughs> but we know that these changes are happening, on average, about 17 years, from about 17 years before people are diagnosed. So, um, in this picture, you can see, if you go from um, left to right, that the, the brain on the left is somebody who has no symptoms, um, but that there is some development at the colour bits you can see are where the pathology is starting to affect them. So, but they're getting these amyloid plaques and tangles in the brain, even though they have no symptoms. Then, people start to have mild symptoms. They might not even notice, really, but th when they think back, they think, oh, yes, actually, that's not been quite right for a while and there's slightly more pathology. And by the time that we, uh, um, that we actually diagnose people, um, there's actually quite a lot of pathology in the brain, in most people, not in everybody. So some people actually get diagnosed at an earlier stage, but this is an average, more typical course. <coughs> current tests, so the graph below shows current tests, and um, the lines to the right that say hippocampal atrophy, entorhinal cortex atrophy, and temporal neocortex so, uh, are things that you can see on a normal MRI scan, so a normal brain scan that we do clinically. And what that graph is saying is that those normal brain scans don't actually show an abnormality until well into the course of the illness. And the only tests we currently have that could diagnose people in that period before they have symptoms are things like it's what's called an amyloid PET imaging. So that involves giving a radioisotope. It costs many hundreds of pounds, and there's a certain risk attached to it. You certainly don't want to do it to the whole population to screen for dementia. And the other thing that we could do would be a lumbar puncture, so we could take some spinal fluid and look for amyloid and tau levels in that. Well, that's quite invasive. You can get a nasty headache after a lumbar puncture. So the, the test that we have that might just catch it earlier on, we couldn't possibly do on a population level. Very expensive. and both they carry risks. So we want to diagnose early, and there's even more impetus to do this um, now because recent treatment trials in dementia, the bigger, the phase three trials, so the trials where they really take it into the big groups of patients with Alzheimer's disease in this case, have actually been thought to <coughs> fail. And this is having an impact on how the drug companies view funding dementia research. So, so although there's a lot of government emphasis on dementia research, drug companies are not generally quite as keen as they used to be. And this, this example um, is the, this autoantibody against amyloid. So amyloid, the plaque that I showed you earlier, um, this is an antibody that binds to it and draws it out of the brain, so reduces accumulation of the plaques. And in animals and in very early studies, it looked as though it might be quite a good treatment to have this antibody. But when they did a big study, it didn't really work. It didn't meet its primary outcome measures. So one question is why? Is it just a rubbish treatment? Well, maybe, but actually when you look at the patients who are in the very earliest stages, so those are the ones with just the, the, the little bit of accumulation of amyloid and tau, that did actually show a significant result. So we're not allowed to do this. We can't go back through trials and reorganise it and say, we just want to look at these ones actually. We want to look at the ones in whom it worked. That's not the way trials work. But if we look back at those, at those data, we can see that there is actually some promise, but it's the diagnosis that is key. We have to diagnose earlier. So there are international studies looking at this, and we are contributing to that literature in Bristol. We are running a study that we call the Hippocampal <coughs> Imaging Trial, and it's called HIPPO for short, which all studies seem to have, to have an abbreviation. It's funded partly by BRACE and partly by Alzheimer's Research UK. 
And we're very lucky to have a big imaging centre that's recently opened in the University of Bristol called Crick Bristol. And this picture here is of their MRI scanner. Um, and we also uh, are very lucky to have Professor Risto Kalpinen, who is an imager who works at Crick and has close links to Siemens, who produce the scanner. So when we run a scan, an MRI scan in hospital, we just run a generic sequence, more or less, that comes, the, the manufacturers give us a sequence to have a look at the brain, for example. And th what we said was, um, we know that the hippocampus is affected early in Alzheimer's disease. We know that um, because we have done detailed um, post-mortem studies and we know from looking at our amyloid studies that the hippocampus is affected earlier and the hippocampus is a critical reason for memory. So memory, your memories go through your hippocampus. So the pictures that you can see on the right is a hippocampus and on <laughs> the, uh, the left, am I right? No. On the left is the hippocampus and on the right is a seahorse. And that's because the, uh, the original Greek anatomists thought the hi hippocampus looked like a seahorse. Um, and hippos is horse and campos is um, sea monster. I think I've got that the right way around. Um, and so this is, um, is so we, we're interested in looking at the hippocampus in dementia and actually designing the sequence. So working with Siemens, we've had an excellent postdoc who's been over um, to Minneapolis to work with Siemens and to reprogram the sequences on the scanner so that they actually target this area called the hippocampus, which we know is affected. So it seems like quite a simple idea, but actually the physics and the programming is very complex. Um, and we're very lucky to have Michael Knight, who's been doing this with us. And one of the simplest things we started doing was just positioning the head so that the hippocampus was actually perpendicular to the magnetic field. Sounds trivial, but you can look at it, you can see it much better if it's in the, if it's in the right orientation. So we've been doing this reprogramming, positioning patients well, and we're starting to get quite good results. So these are all, all the data on the whole that I'm presenting are preliminary. So um, you, the, the, you know, things may change as we accumulate more, but I just wanted to give you a snippet of what we're actually finding. So this um, scan on the left is from a 21-year-old participant. It's a normal brain, and the area of that circled in blue is where the hippocampus sits. And we're getting really good pictures of the hippocampus, this quite small area within the brain, we can see. And because of our, re, um, our reprogramming the scanner, we can now get the same level of detail in about 20 to 30 minutes um, that we used to take one and a half hours to get. And really, one and a half hours is not a feasible time to expect anybody to lie on a scanner, least of all somebody who has dementia or is worried about a diagnosis of dementia. So with this reprogramming, we are getting fee uh, practical scans um, that we can apply in dementia of the right areas. So the next question we ask is, uh, so we think we're getting good pictures in healthy young people. What about if we scan people who are um, older and perhaps if we scan people who have memory problems? So we're looking at this group of people with mild cognitive impairment. So if you remember from the original graph, that's that section before people get deme frank dementia. So it's not the very earliest changes. We'd really like to find people then, but it is fairly early. It's before people have a diagnosis. And I don't know if you can see um, clearly, but the area in the blue circle, um, that's where the hippocampus is. And if you look at on the left, the 21-year-old, that's a very full, nice hippocampus. I mean, they're all nice hippocampi, but um, they, they're, it's a very full, it's an absolutely normal size. Um, then we had a 79-year-old age-matched control participant. Um, and you start to see there that the brain's not quite as full as at the age of 21, but actually that's normal. All our brains um, shrink with age, unfortunately. It's a peak around 28, I think, and then it all starts to get a bit worse. Um, so we're <laughs> looking at one of my PhD students who are <laughs> still, in, still, still rising. Um, and um, then we had an 84-year-old participant with mild cognitive impairment, and you can see, again, that actually that hippocampus is smaller. So, I mean, I'm showing you these, and you may think, well, that's easy then, that, you know, we can see clear differences. But I picked these examples out because they demonstrate the changes very clearly. In fact, when we look at the groups that we're beginning to accumulate, there is some overlap. So although by using a detailed scanning, we can get a better idea about the size of the hippocampus, this alone is not enough. So what are we moving on to? Well... We have some um, very hard-working PhD students who've developed a way of looking not just at the hippocampus, but at the areas within it, so what we call the hippocampal subfields. 
So there are several areas within the hippocampus. We know from looking down the microscope at brains, they're there, but it's very hard to see them in, 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 in on scans. And they actually spend seven or eight hours um, drawing around the different areas. We are planning to automate this, but we because we've got more detailed pictures than ever before, um, we are doing it by hand at the moment to get really clear pictures of the hippocampus. And they're coloured in here, these different areas of the hippocampus. And these are very preliminary data, so we sort of burn after reading. We don't know if they're going to, to, to end up being correct, but we are starting to show some differences between age-matched participants and participants with mild cognitive impairment. We have an Alzheimer's degree, an Alzheimer's disease group as well, but we, th th we're not analysing that quite in this way yet. So we are starting to see some differences in two particular areas, um, an area called the dentate gyrus, which is um, pink on this picture, and an area called SRSLSM, which is green. So what we're going to ask with this study as it continues is, so, I don't think you can see that. Could reduction in the size of these subfields predict dementia? Because we can see them better than anyone has before, quicker than anyone has before. Are we going to be able to predict dementia using these subfields? The answer is... We don't know. But that's the point of the study. That's what we're going to have a look at. And we're very pleased that we're beginning to show differences between people who have memory problems in the earlier stages and healthy ageing, we think. But we don't know yet. So this is just what's, what's, what's going on at the moment. Because this is primarily an imaging study, that's what I've focused on. But we're also doing very detailed neuropsychology in these patients. So they sit down and do cognitive tests. I don't know if any of you did the reaction time test at the research stand at the back. But that's the sort of way that we do cognitive tasks, um, get people to press computer um, buttons in response to seeing something on a screen, and then we measure reaction times and memory, etc. Please go and do the reaction time test, because I was the slowest person <laughs> so far, and I'm sure that can't be right. So I think we need a, I think, I think we need a bigger sample. Um, we're also very lucky to collaborate with... Um, Myra Conway, Professor Myra Conway at UWE, who um, are sending off some serum biomarkers. And so these, these another, could we just take a blood test that might tell us who's got dementia? And, and Myra's doing some of the analysis for us. And we're also doing some genotyping. And what we don't know is whether our MRI scans alone will um, say this person's likely to have dementia or whether MRI scans plus a blood test or MRI scans plus neuropsychology will be really helpful. But that's the aim of our study over the next couple of years. So, technically, we've sort of done it with the help of uh, our physicist postdoc and the Siemens company, um, and we can scan a higher resolution at a shorter time. But, and we think we're quite excited about the initial data, but we really have to keep um, collecting data to see if, if this is actually going to work. So, next I'm going to talk a bit about our clinical trials. So. Um, but Bristol was a bustling clinical trial centre until about 10 years ago. And then partly because <coughs> Professor Wilcock moved to Oxford, and I guess there was a, a variety of other circumstances, clinical trials stopped happening in Bristol. But we know we have the population who are keen to take part in clinical trials, and we have those laboratory findings that I mentioned coming through. So we are really looking to get clinical trials um, going again, and we, we are, actually. So, um, so this is one that's open at the moment. It's called RADAR, and it's led from Bristol, although it's a national study, and it's led by Professor Pat Kehoe, who um, is in the Dementia Research Group. I showed you his photograph earlier, and also Yoav Ben Shlomo, who is an epidemiologist and trial, designs trials. Um, it's funded by the National Institute of Health Research, who, and the, the money actually comes from the MRC by an agreement between the two. So, very cl crudely, um, the radar trial is based on the principle that um, comes, is, it, it comes up again and again, actually, that what's good for the heart is good for the head. And this really alludes to the relationship between the blood flow to the brain and the way the brain functions. The two are intimately related. So, if you don't have enough blood to your brain, your brain doesn't work as well as it should. When you think in an area, the blood flow to the area goes up, according to our functional imaging work. So uh, we know that dementia and blood flow, so the amyloid plaques that I showed you earlier in particular, are very closely related to blood supply. So, and it's not just that you may have had poor blood supply and Alzheimer's pathology, and therefore we have two things, and therefore your thinking is worse. They actually make each other worse. So as your blood supply goes down, the amyloid goes up, and amyloid probably has an effect on blood vessels to make them function as well as well. 
So it really is true that improving blood flow to the brain is a, is a good way potentially to help dementia, but we have to show that. That's why we do a clinical trial. The theory's there, but will it actually work? That's what the aim of the trial is. So some more evidence that this might work. Well, you can, these are probable, we always like to say, modifiable risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that the top four, so hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol and smoking, all relate to blood flow. So it wouldn't be surprising that improving blood flow would help dementia. Um, but it, more than this, some work's been done in Bristol and elsewhere that's looked back at GP records and looked at the sort of drugs that open up blood vessels. So we think that reducing your blood pressure gives healthy blood vessels, that should be good. It's, there's more to it than that because we looked at the type of agent to reduce blood pressure. There are lots of different tablets to reduce blood pressure. And if patients were on certain tablets to reduce blood pressure, and these are particularly called angiotensin receptor blockers um, and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, so <laughs> don't, don't remember those names, but particular types of drugs seem to have reduced levels of dementia. So this is a retrospective study, it's looking back at records. Um, it, it, there, are, there are potential for there to be error in it, but there is fairly good grounds to consider that certain blood pressure agents would, um, it, it would, would reduce your risk of dementia. So this is, if you believe it, an oversimplified diagram. <laughs> um, and I'm not gonna go into the details, but just to say that this, uh, this substance called angiotensin, angiotensin II acts on blood vessels and causes them to constrict. So we know that there's something within the body that's naturally produced within the body and causes your blood vessels to constrict. And the drug that we're looking at in radar gets between angiotensin II and its receptor. So it's an angiotensin receptor blocker and it stops those blood vessels constricting. So it opens up your blood vessels. So it's good from that point of view, but it has a, it has a double-edged benefit in that the, if we keep blood vessels open, the body tries to close them in some ways by producing this enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, and that enzyme also breaks down amyloid. So amyloid's critical for dementia, so are blood vessels. It seemed win-win to try this agent, Losartan, in dementia, but it hadn't been tried. So that's what radar is doing. What are we doing? Well, someone believed in it enough to, um, to fund it, and it's going to cost about £2 million from NIHR. We are opening out to more than 10 sites across the UK, but Bristol so far is the only site to have opened. And we have had our first recru recruits through, um, and we're going to aim to get 228 people over a couple of years. We give them either this substance, Losartan or placebo, and they don't know which, and we don't know which. And um, they are randomized using um, a computerized system, so it's done centrally, so we have no idea. We just get a, a number, and then we go and pick it up from pharmacy, and then we give them the tablets. We don't, have any, we don't know who's got what. Um, and what we do is you do an MRI scan at the start of the study and at the end, and this is where all kind of links together because by looking in detail at the structure of the whole brain and the hippocampus, we look to see if the disease has progressed <coughs> as much in patients taking Losartan as it has in patients who are not taking Losartan. So we won't know until the end of the study, at the end of the two years, when we've got all the scans, well, three years by the time people have had their follow-up scan. But that is underway now. As well as scanning, we're also looking at memory tests and we're assessing quality of life. Uh, but they're what we call secondary outcome measures. So our primary outcome is whether or not the scan is affected by taking Losartan. So this is my little signal to remind myself to say that we are, we are recruiting for this study now. And we also have um, a few more studies coming online over the next year. We, because we do research on people, we can't manage, we can't go ahead unless people want to do our research. We think that it's good quality, and it's very hard to get funding, even if it is good quality, but it's, you know, we, that's, that is one sort of arbiter that, that the study is worth doing if somebody will give you two million pounds to do it. So if you know um, anyone who wants to take part, or if you want to take part, please let us know. Um, we will happily see you in clinic, and if this study doesn't suit you, then we have others coming up.
So that's my little plea um, out of the way. Right, so these are our other clinical trials. Because we're running late, I won't talk about them too much, but the principle is more or less the same. These trials are both looking at different agents that affect blood flow in some ways to the brain. And we are, um, they, they will both run over about a year, and we will look at things at the start and the end, and people won't know if they're taking the substance or taking a placebo. Um, the only difference is actually that ELAD is in patients with early Alzheimer's disease, whereas AFFECT is in patients with subcortical ischemic vascular dementia. So what we're quite pleased with in our group is that we're starting to develop opportunities for research for people with all different sorts of dementia. So it's not just Alzheimer's disease. It's, um, it's just, we have a study for dementia with Lewy bodies, have vascular dementia. Um, so we're starting to develop studies for everyone. Because one of the government's priorities was to get 10% of people diagnosed with dementia in research trials. And um, again, we're not quite there yet, but we are increasing the number of people who can do research. So the last thing is improving quality of life. So what can we do now with substances that are available now, with things that we know how to, how to work? We don't have to wait for a new fancy drug, we can just try it now. And th the answer is, what, can we get the brain that's there already to work a bit harder? So we can't stop the process of dementia, but we can make what's there at more active. Well, that is actually the aim of the tablets that are routinely prescribed for dementia. So um, if you've been diagnosed with dementia, the chances are you've been offered um, a drug, the names are Dinepazil, Galantamine, there are a couple of others, um, to try and boost the way that your brain works. They're licensed in Alzheimer's disease and in dementia with Lewy bodies, and they, occasionally we use them off license in other dementias, but we, we can't, you know, that's, the, that's, that's, and that's between the, us and the patient, really. <laughs> Um, so, um, so, so that's the aim of them. The aim of them is to make what's there work as well as possible. They don't alter the disease itself. So what have we been looking at? Well, I'm just going to mention three studies that we're doing in our group. I'm going to remember them quickly, uh, but I'm going to mention them quickly. But I do think they're, uh, that's not to diminish them. I think they're really interesting studies. We've been looking at the role of dopamine <laughs> in memory. So dopamine is given to patients with Parkinson's routinely. We prescribe it every week as neurologists. Um, and there's been lots of controversy about whether dopamine makes memory worse, makes it better, um, has any effect at all. Um, and so we set about looking at this in more detail and we varied the time of day that people had it and we varied the type of memory tasks they had to do. And what we found was that the time of day is critical. So if you have dopamine when you're trying to take on information during the day and you're trying to learn that, then actually it is not a good thing to have. But if you have it overnight when you're trying to lay down and consolidate memories, then it appears to help memory consolidation. So this is, we think, potentially exciting because it's something that's available now and that may help just to, even if it boosts mem people's memory by 20%, if they don't have significant side effects, then it could be beneficial. So we're trying that and we're trying it in healthy elderly people to see if we still get the same effect. It could just be an effect in Parkinson's patients. Because so far, those are the only people we tested. We took them on and off their dopamine. And does it work in dementia? So that, those are the things we're trying now. We've got, we haven't started this study yet, but we're um, looking to get funding for something which I think is a really interesting area of dementia care, and that's whether exercise helps with um, dementia, dementia itself. So there are quality of life improvements in exercising. It's good for your heart and therefore we think it must be good for your head. But actually it's more sophisticated than that because when we get animals to exercise, I've never done this myself, I've no idea how they get animals to exercise, but when they do get them to exercise, they, um, they show that the type of exercise that's done affects exactly which areas of the brain are improved and what type of memory, what type of learning um, is benefited. And there's some preliminary data in humans, so in people with mild cognitive impairment and early dementia, it looks like exercise could be very positive. But, but we want to look and see whether it's actually feasible. So at a recent event, we mentioned exercise, and someone was saying, well, how do you expect us to do exercise? We've got people who are, are not very mobile. You can't suddenly start doing lots of exercise. So we have to look and see, make it a feasible thing for people, target it to, to the people who actually can do the exercise or develop a stepped program so it's reasonable for people to do. And also to try and understand a bit about how it works, because it looks like it's more than just a general boost. Your blood flow's a bit better, your mood's better, so your cognition's better. It looks like it might actually be, have a specific effect on the way that the brain regenerates. So we want to try and understand that a bit more. 
And also, we're looking at the, the effects of caffeine in dementia and Lewy So this is really um, a simple idea. We all take a stimulant every day, at least I take a lot of it, um, to try and get through the day. And we know that it disturbs sleep and affects attention. And we know that people particularly dementia with Lewy bodies, have um, sleep disorders and problems with attention. And what, but what we don't have any idea about, really, is whether the two interact at all. So whether day-to-day -day caffeine worsens or enhances symptoms um, of, of dementia, particularly dementia with Lewy bodies. And we're just starting to look at this. And in fact, we haven't tested any patients with dementia yet, but we have found some really interesting effects of caffeine, potentially if they hold up on um, attention in healthy elderly people. Um, so it's looking quite promising and quite interesting, um, but uh, we, 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 again, we're working on it. So an overview is that we're working on early accurate diagnosis. We, we are underway um, with clinical trials to modify disease, and we are also looking at in, in pharmacological means to enhance cognition and improve quality of life. And we're not doing this in isolation. You may have heard of the Dementia Health Integration Team. So we are allied with our university partners, our NHS partners, and also Bristol City Council and, um, and the clinical commissioning groups and all the local um, health trusts are now part of the health integration team. So initiatives should, be, should affect all of us and we're all working together to try and help people with dementia. And then I'd just like to make some acknowledgements. Um, I can't go through everybody, but the group is really growing. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge our funders. And although it's a Brace day, so you'd expect me to thank Brace in particular, uh, particularly, um, it should, should be pointed out that you know, three years ago, th there was a sort of, an, uh, there wasn't dementia research, there wasn't clinical dementia research, and it's because of the funding from Brace to pump around um, various posts and give us a building and some space that this has been able to happen. So it's really because of the people that donate to Brace and the Brace charity decision to, to push dementia research in Bristol that all these initiatives are now up and running. So thank you very much. But it's absolutely brilliant. That was quite, quite fantastic. And, uh, and, and, and I think it shows the intensity and the range of the focus that you've got on, uh, on all aspects of dementia. It's really, really terrific. And how you're following up, following up certain avenues and, and looking at inventing new, new ones, you know, the whole time. Really fantastic. And the other impressive thing, I thought, was the degree of the partnerships because partnership is absolutely the way forward. And one of the problems that you have, particularly where charities are concerned, is that everyone's often going down their own particular path. That happens in the medical profession as well. They go down their own path, and they're so passionate about what they're doing that it's like a railway train going down its track without taking any notice of, of trains or the roads that are on parallel tracks and where those might intersect. And I think the brilliant thing uh, about everything that is going on now, the whole mood of what is happening in the country is to have much more cooperation. While you retain the pride in your own particular project and what you're doing, which is essential, the fact is that in order to achieve progress, people are now realizing that you do need to cooperate and you do need to get together, and that is wonderful. Now, I'm conscious that we're, you, you, you helped us catch up a bit of time, actually, which was really terrific. Let's, uh, let's still come back here, if we would, at uh, 20 past one after, after having had a very quick bite of lunch um, for the afternoon session. And this gives me an opportunity to say something I wasn't able to say the whole of the time I worked at the BBC. Join us after the break. <laughs>